Hello and welcome class. Today we're going to be talking about the reform movements during the early and mid 1800s in the United States, also known as the antebellum period. To start, let's define the word antebellum. It actually comes from two Latin words, ante, which means before, and bellum, which means war. So basically, antebellum means we're talking about the period before war. Which war? The war! And by that we mean the Civil War. During this period, Americans wanted to reform the country, meaning that they wanted to improve the nation and address some of the problems that were plaguing society, such as overcrowding, poverty, illiteracy, alcoholism, poor health care, and other issues developing as the country began to change due to industrialization. For many, these reform movements were reflections of their religious principles and faith and were to a great extent motivated by a revival of religious participation known as the Second Great Awakening. For these people, they wanted to extend personal improvement to national improvement, some going so far as to try and build utopian societies or small communities dedicated to perfection. Some examples of these utopian societies are Robert Owen's town, New Harmony, which was in Indiana. It failed. Or the Shaker Society, an offshoot of the Quakers, which also failed. However, regardless of their success, many of these reform movements were trying to change society and improve it based on their own personal and oftentimes religious beliefs. When we talk about reform movements, there were many areas of reform that were focused on during this period. Some of them were on national and public issues. Others were related to personal issues. They ranged from goals that included caring for the poor, for the disabled, for the mentally ill, as well as how do we treat criminals in our society. While we won't be able to address all of these reform movements, we will focus on some of the larger groups, including the movements to provide public education, the movement to secure rights for women, including suffrage, which is the right to vote, the temperance movement that wanted to decrease the use of alcohol, and the transcendentalists who were often influential in various reform movements. And of course, we will begin looking at the abolitionist movement, which sought to end slavery and increasingly became more uncompromising in their views. But before we can start talking about any of these movements, we need to start by first looking at the role religion played in shaping these antebellum reform movements. While there were many factors that influenced the movements during this period, the Second Great Awakening was one of the most influential. The Second Great Awakening was a period of renewed religious faith that emerged as a result of the pressures from a changing society. Americans were becoming more industrialized, cities were growing, immigration brought new people, new cultures, and new religions to the country, and at times these changes were blamed for problems that were emerging in the nation. The Second Great Awakening was in some ways a response to these changes as people renewed their religious faith through Protestant revivals that revived or brought people back to a religious life. Prior to this period, as a nation, the country was not actively religious. In 1790, during the presidency of George Washington, only about one in 10 Americans were members of churches. However, by the mid 1800s, that number had tripled to three in 10. The greatest growth during the Second Great Awakening was in the Baptist and the Methodist denominations, both which began in England during the 16 and 1700s. These two groups had the largest number of converts in the United States during the Second Great Awakening, particularly in the South and the West. The Unitarians also grew during this period, mostly in New England. In addition, some entirely new Christian denominations formed in response to a dissatisfaction with already established faiths. These faiths formed their own doctrines. One such example is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, commonly known as the Mormons. During the Second Great Awakening, revivals were taking place across the country, but one of the areas most involved was in New York State, in towns along the Erie Canal. This area became so involved in the Protestant revivals, it later became known as the Burned Over District, a phrase that was coined by Charles Finney on account of how heavily the area had been evangelized, that there was no fuel left to quote-unquote burn, meaning there was no one left to convert. This area is where Mormon leader Joseph Smith was from, as well as the Shakers and numerous other religious leaders of the time. This period also saw a shift to a more optimistic tone regarding religion. New Light revivalists, transcendentalists, and Unitarians all shared a more optimistic belief about individual change. They rejected earlier beliefs by Calvinists that people were helpless and that life was predetermined or already decided. Instead, they believed people could change. One of the most well-known religious figures of this period was a revival leader named Charles Finney. Finney believed that people could adapt and change, that people could reform themselves, which influenced those who were feeling threatened by the changing world around them. 
Another figure was Lyman Beecher, who taught that good people would make good countries. Beecher and his family would be involved with a number of the reform movements during this period, but we'll do more on that later. These religious leaders, revivalists such as Finney, mobilized people, and especially focused on women, to join and champion their causes. To their supporters, revivalism meant more than just personal salvation. It was also a way to control society, especially in regards to issues of immorality. While religion played an important role in revival movements, philosophers who rejected traditional religions also influenced the movements. One such philosophical movement centered in Concord, Massachusetts, and was known as the Transcendentalists. To transcend means to rise above, and Transcendentalism believed spiritual discovery and insight would lead to personal truths. They rejected group worship and believed in private inward searching, believing that they could personally rise above to discover these truths. They taught that people should be self-reliant and that humans were naturally good. Two of the most well-known transcendentalists were Ralph Waldo Emerson, who was a poet and lecturer and essayist, who was staunchly opposed to slavery, and the other, Henry David Thoreau, who was also a poet and essayist and a lifelong abolitionist. Thoreau is most well-known today for his writings on civil disobedience, which argued that individuals have the duty to resist laws that are unjust and that would make them become individual agents of injustice ideas that were motivated by the issues of slavery and the Mexican-American War. With such strong philosophical and religious beliefs, people turned their attention to issues they felt should be addressed. One such issue dealt with the consumption of alcohol and was known as the temperance movement. For revivalists, the one thing most responsible for crime, poverty, and destructive societal ills was alcohol. Their goal was to temper, which means to act as a neutralizing or counterbalancing force. They wanted to temper the use of alcohol. Quite simply, their goal was to persuade people to consume less alcohol. As the movement became more popular, those within the temperance movement shifted their goals from voluntary abstinence, or restraining oneself from something, and then later to legal prohibition, formally forbidding by law the production and sale of alcohol. During the early 1800s, alcohol supplies were growing, in part because Western farmers were distilling their grain into profitable whiskey, which we talked about back when we covered the Whiskey Rebellion. This wasn't a problem that was concentrated in one area. Alcohol was widely used in the East and in the West, through saloons and in pubs. Alcohol was often a social pastime and at times was used for political events and campaign rallies. In the 1830s, the average male drank three times as much alcohol as the average person does today. However, the temperance movement did not begin in the 1830s or the 1800s at all. In fact, temperance activities were active since the 1700s, but revivalists gave the movement new energy. In 1826, the American Society for the Promotion of Temperance formed and began to coordinate groups around the nation. Women were key participants in the temperance movement, and they believed that the use of alcohol placed burdens on them. Women argued that their husbands wasted money that families needed on alcohol, that drunken husbands abused their wives and their children. Large rallies included speakers who discussed their past sins with alcohol as a way to inspire listeners to join the movement and push for temperance and abstinence. However, as the movement grew, divisions appeared over some key issues. Some groups called for only the end of the use of liquor, such as whiskey, but not for beer and wine. Other groups called for an end to all alcohol. Some called for state legislation to restrict sale and consumption, which Maine did in 1851 when it banned the manufacture and sale of alcohol. Yet others believe that temperance should be done based on the conscience of individuals and not forced down by the government. Finally, immigration also became an issue because at the time many Catholics were immigrating to the United States. During the 1830s, 250,000 Catholics immigrated, and that number tripled in the 1840s to 750,000. In addition to an increase in Catholic immigrants, the church was also successful at spreading among new immigrants. These immigrants and converts to Catholicism held different views regarding alcohol. Many who supported temperance saw the movement as a way of controlling these new arrivals and to solve some of the problems that they blamed immigrants for, such as crime, poverty, and job loss. In many ways, you could say that the movement was successful. Many governments, both state and local, passed laws banning alcohol, though many of these laws were repealed as time went on. 
On an individual level, many people signed pledges to avoid all alcohol. These people became known as teetotalers. Overall, during this period, consumption of alcohol for persons over the age of 15 drastically fell from 7 gallons a year to 1.8 gallons a year. Beyond these results, the temperance movement was important because it became an example for how to organize voluntary societies to influence public opinion. And because many people were involved in many different movements, this knowledge would spread to these other movements so they could learn to effectively organize and persuade the public. Another important movement of the era was the education reform movement. If you've ever wondered who decided that you should go to school, you can thank people like Horace Mann and his work to provide public education. The push for education began long before Horace Mann arrived on the scene in the 1800s. Education in the United States had long been advocated going back to the colonial period. For example, Benjamin Franklin was a strong advocate for education. He published a pamphlet in 1749 discussing the aims of education, and it led directly to the founding of the Academy of Philadelphia, which is now known as the University of Pennsylvania. Others, from Thomas Jefferson to Benjamin Rush to Noah Webster of Webster's Dictionary fame, all argued for increased education. However, by the 1830s, there were still no state education systems. Instead, it was a local community-operated school here and there. Often, girls were not sent to school, and if they did, they regularly attended for a shorter time. In most cases, African Americans were not allowed in the schools at all. In the 1830s, interest grew to provide universal public education, and reformers believed that every person had the capability to excel, and it was the society's job to help people access that potential. One of the main figures of this movement I've mentioned before, it is Horace Mann. In 1837, Horace Mann became the first secretary of the Massachusetts Board of Education. In this new role, Mann worked to reorganize the school system in his state. He made the school year longer, he increased teacher pay, and he created normal schools, which were teacher training schools. Mann wanted to create school systems that were tuition-free and instead were paid by the taxpayers. This would provide universal access to education across the entire state rather than the patchwork of local schools. Massachusetts was not the only state that began to move toward universal access to schools. However, while schools became more widely available in northern states, free public schools in the south were less common. Furthermore, girls were often discouraged from attending schools or only taught to read and write. African Americans were often completely excluded or sent to separate schools that were far inferior to the local public school. Colleges were even more limited for African Americans and women. While some advocated for co-education of men and women, for example Benjamin Rush who founded Dickinson College, most universities only accepted white males. As a result of these barriers, many were kept from education, especially women and African Americans. And so the movement began pushing for co-education and access for African Americans. Oberlin College in Ohio opened in 1833 and was one of the first to allow women, and in 1835 it also began accepting African Americans. Additionally, a number of black colleges were formed such as Cheney, Lincoln, and Wilberforce, with many more opening following the Civil War. Yet despite these barriers, college attendance was increasing and colleges were expanding during this period. In 1815, there were only 33 colleges in the entire United States. By 1835, 20 years later, that number had over doubled to 68. And only 12 years later in 1848, it had doubled almost again to 133 colleges. Literacy in the United States increased, and by the beginning of the Civil War in 1861, the United States had a literacy rate of 94% in the North and 58% in the South. This was the highest rate in the world, though the literacy rates varied by region. For example, New England had no state under 98%, while at the same time, North Carolina only had a literacy rate of 28%. In addition, normal schools were formed to help train future teachers. For example, Eastern Michigan University opened as Michigan State Normal School in 1853 and today is still known for its teacher education program. The social ills that reformers sought to solve and the morality established during the Second Great Awakening were influential in the school reform movement. A typical reform in the education movement was an effort to teach children social values. Informed by their belief, reformers sought to teach children discipline, punctuality, respect for authority, and social order. Horace Mann, noting Proverbs, said, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. One of the most important movements of this time was the abolitionist movement, which we will return to as we discuss the events leading to the Civil War. 
1619, just 12 years after the founding of the first British colony in the New World, Jamestown, the first shipment of African slaves arrived in Virginia. Even before the revolution and the formation of the United States, there were calls to limit or end slavery in the colonies. At the Constitutional Convention, delegates debated the future of slavery in the New Republic, nearly ending the Republic before it began. It was only through a series of compromises that the country could finally be established. These compromises included the Great Compromise, which created a bicameral legislature giving equal representation in the Senate and proportional representation in the House of Representatives. The notorious Three-Fifths Compromise gave slave states the ability to count three out of five slaves when determining their representation. And finally, an agreement was reached to not address the slave trade until after 1800. From the start, slavery was an issue that divided Americans. Early abolitionists advocated for gradual emancipation, first by stopping the slave trade and then phasing out slavery over a period of time. To many, this seemed like a likely way that slavery would end, and many saw signs that slavery would eventually disappear in the early years of the Republic. These abolitionists expressed their moral disapproval to slavery, but did not take much action. Yet, during the late 1700s, several anti-slavery groups formed in the North, and abolitionist newspapers appeared in both the North and the South. By 1804, every state north of Maryland passed laws gradually abolishing slavery, and in 1808, importation of slaves ended. For many early abolitionists, the solution to slavery centered on the idea of colonization or resettling African Americans to either Africa or the Caribbean. Many white abolitionists did not believe in racial equality and they wanted to move free African Americans out of the country. Others believed that African Americans would never receive equal treatment and sought to remove them. One such example is Paul Cuffey, an African American businessman and sailor. Cuffey was aware that inequality existed in the United States. And after becoming a Quaker, he was asked to assist in the resettlement of free blacks to the British colony of Sierra Leone. Cuffey was able to secure a land grant, and in December 1815, he and 38 black settlers sailed for Sierra Leone. He then returned to the United States late in 1816, seeking backing for another voyage and wanting to build a network to help with resettlement. However, he died in 1817, and other black leaders were not sure Africa was the right choice for them. In 1817, the American Colonization Society formed through the work of prominent white Virginians. These men were careful to deal with slavery in a way that avoided any challenges to property rights or to southern social structures. They believed in gradual manumission, where slave owners freed their slaves and were compensated through funds raised by abolitionists. Some slave owners believed that colonization was the best option for dealing with slavery because it would eliminate the threat of freed slaves encouraging slave revolts. Once free, the society would move the freed slaves out of the country. In 1830, the country of Liberia was established on the western coast of Africa as this location for colonization. However, by 1831, only 1,400 freed blacks and former slaves had migrated to the country. While colonization was popular with slave owners and other white Americans, many African Americans had no desire to move to a place they knew nothing about and that was so distant. Many wanted to improve their lives in their home, the United States. In addition of a lack of support from African Americans, the plan was not capable of resettling so many people. As a result of these challenges, the abolitionist movement was losing strength. At the same time, the cotton boom was increasing Southern reliance on slavery. Like Paul Cuffey, many who led the movement came from the Quaker faith. One such man, Benjamin Lundy, began an abolitionist paper called Genius of Universal Emancipation. Lundy, like many early abolitionists, believed in gradual emancipation. However, his assistant, William Lloyd Garrison, was not happy with such a plan. Garrison hated slavery, but thought that moderate proposals and mild tones were ineffective. Garrison would go on to be an important abolitionist leader and one who called for more radical responses to slavery. Eventually, Garrison left Lundy and returned to Boston, where he began his weekly newspaper, The Liberator. Garrison became a radical abolitionist and formed the American Anti-Slavery Society. He believed that the opposition of slavery should shift away from the viewpoint that slavery was a horrible institution for what it did to white men and white society, making them brutal and oppressive, and instead should be looking at it from the viewpoint of the slaves and how cruel and brutal it was to them. 
Because of this viewpoint, Garrison believed the only solution was immediate, unconditional, and universal abolition without compensation. He went much further than many abolitionists, many who did not believe in racial equality. He believed that all African Americans should have full citizenship rights, including the right to vote. His positions were drastic for the time, and his speeches uncompromising. By 1835, there were more than 400 chapters of his society, and three years later that number more than tripled to 1,350 with a quarter million members. Like other reform movements, the abolitionists had tapped into the idea that individuals could improve themselves and their society. They also saw slavery as a sin, and religious revivalism had overlapping involvement with the abolitionist movement. Many revivalist families participated in multiple reform movements, from temperance to abolition. One such example is the famed religious figure Lyman Beecher, prominent in the revivalist movement, but also an abolitionist. His daughter, Harriet Beecher Stowe, wrote a popular best-selling novel that portrayed slavery's cruelty and brutality called Uncle Tom's Cabin. In addition to religious figures, African Americans played important leadership roles in the abolition movement as well. Around a quarter million African Americans lived in the North. However, despite being free of slavery, they often lived in conditions of poverty and faced discrimination. Most did not have access to education, and only a few states allowed voting. By 1855, only Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, and Vermont allowed African Americans to vote. Most African Americans were denied access to jobs other than servants or sailors, and many began to support Garrison and subscribe to the Liberator. Supporters of abolition began speaking around the country, and former slaves like Sojourner Truth and Frederick Douglass became powerful voices for abolition. Many spent years on the road lecturing to crowds about slavery both in the United States and around the world. Douglass was the most influential African-American abolitionist. Born a slave, he escaped and published his autobiography, Life and Times of Frederick Douglass. Through his speeches on speaking tours, he convinced people of the evils of slavery and helped spread the message of abolitionists through his newspaper, The North Star. Some abolitionists went beyond speaking and persuading and developed networks of escape routes that allowed slaves to flee to the North and to freedom. These abolitionists risked being arrested and at times risked their lives to assist escaping slaves so they could reach Canada and the North. It's unclear how many escaped using the Underground Railroad, but historians estimate anywhere between 40,000 and 100,000 slaves used the series of safe houses to journey to safety. The most famous conductor was Harriet Tubman, who escaped herself in 1849 before returning to rescue her family and later over the years helped more than 300 other slaves escape. Her work earned her the nickname the Black Moses. Some abolitionists also advocated for violence, such as John Brown. He advocated for mass slave uprisings and participated himself in raids on slaveholders in Kansas. In 1859, just a few years before the beginning of the Civil War, Brown and a group of men attacked the federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry as part of a plan to secure weapons to distribute among slaves and help begin a slave uprising. Brown was motivated by religious belief. He felt slavery was a sin and that he was doing the work ordained by God to end slavery. However, his raid was unsuccessful and Brown was caught, tried, and executed. At his trial, Brown told the court, I have always freely admitted what I have done in behalf of God's despised poor is no wrong, but right. Now if it is deemed necessary that I should forfeit my life for the furtherance of the ends of justice and mingle my blood farther with the blood of my children and with the blood of millions in this slave country whose rights are disregarded by wicked, cruel, and unjust enactments, I say, let it be done. Abolitionists did not always agree on how to end slavery and what to do once it was finished. While men like William Lloyd Garrison and John Brown sought a radical response to slavery, others feared it went too far. The debate over a moderate and a radical approach split the movement. Another split came in regards to the participation of women in the movement. At the time, most Americans did not approve of women participating in political gatherings. William Lloyd Garrison insisted that female abolitionists be allowed to speak at meetings. Women like Sojourner Truth, Sarah and Angelina Grimke became important figures in the abolitionist movement. White Southerners and slave owners met the abolitionist movement with powerful opposition. Most white Southerners, but also many white Northerners, were afraid and disliked the abolitionist movement. 
They saw it as a threat to the social system, and some feared it would lead to war. Some Northerners also worried that it would lead to a large migration of African Americans into the North. The result of this opposition was a wave of violence against abolitionists in the 1830s. For example, Prudence Crandall attempted to admit an African American girl to her private school in Connecticut. As a result, she was arrested and her school was shut down. The abolitionist headquarters in Philadelphia was attacked by a mob and burned down. In Boston, a mob seized William Lloyd Garrison and threatened to hang him. He was only saved by being put in jail. One of the most prominent events involved Elijah Lovejoy, who ran an abolitionist newspaper and was repeatedly attacked and his printing press destroyed. Yet each time, he rebuilt and continued to be an outspoken opponent of slavery. In 1837, Lovejoy's print shop was attacked by a mob for a fourth time. This time, Lovejoy attempted to defend his press from the mob, so the attackers set fire to his building. As Lovejoy tried to escape, he was shot and killed. Lovejoy's death was a shock to the nation. John Quincy Adams called it a shock as of an earthquake throughout the continent, and the Boston Recorder said the events resulted in a burst of indignation which has not had its parallel in this country since the Battle of Lexington. Meanwhile, in Congress, white Southerners were able to pass a gag rule in response to the accusations and criticisms being thrown at them from abolitionists. This gag rule prohibited any anti-slavery petition from being read or acted on in the House of Representatives for eight years. Abolitionists pointed to it as a threat to the rights of Americans, both white and black. This conflict over slavery would eventually lead to the Civil War in 1861. The participation of women in the abolitionist movement would help give rise to another movement to help secure the rights of women. Women involved in the movement to abolish slavery and secure freedoms for African Americans turned their attention to their own lack of freedom and rights. Two important influential reformers were Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who first met at an anti-slavery convention in London. When they arrived, they were denied entry as delegates because they were women, and the two discussed a shared interest in a movement for women's rights. They later met back in the United States and began planning a convention to address the issue of women's rights. In the early 1800s, a new social structure was emerging for many middle and upper class women that divided the family into separate spheres for men and women. Women were expected to focus their energies on the home and raising children, while men were expected to produce income and participate politically. These separate spheres became known as the cult of domesticity. In addition to social norms, laws also restricted women and gave them the same status as a minor. These laws denied women the right to vote. In most states, women could not own property or make wills. If women worked outside the home, they could not keep their income and had to turn it over to their husbands or fathers. Women could not bring a case in court without their husband's permission. They also could not petition for a divorce, and in the event of a divorce, the children and property belong to the husband. As a result of the education movement, women were becoming more educated, and they were being admitted to colleges. Many became resentful at the restrictions, and they wanted to extend their skills and knowledge beyond the home. Further, the religious revival movement of the early 1800s gave women roles in reform movements such as temperance and abolition, and this led to them seeking changes for themselves as well. Over the next several years, women began to draw parallels between the lack of rights women had to the lack of rights slaves had. Mott and Stanton organized the Women's Right Convention in 1848, the first one in the United States. The convention was held in Stanton's hometown, Seneca Falls, New York, and had nearly 300 people attend, including the abolitionist Frederick Douglass. The convention produced a Declaration of Sentiment and Resolution, which was modeled after the Declaration of Independence, but it was revised to state that all men and women were created equal. The Declaration rejected the idea of separate spheres, it protested the lack of legal and political rights, it called for an end to laws that discriminated against women, it demanded women be able to enter trades and profession that they had been barred from, and it called for the right to vote. While this convention was often identified as the start of the women's movement, women began advocating for their rights well before Seneca Falls. Over the mid-1800s, women successfully gained the right to own and retain property. They were able to seek divorces and retain custody of their children in the event of a divorce. Women moved into fields reserved for men, such as Elizabeth Blackwell, who became a physician. 
Others formed societies and organizations such as Emma Willard and Catherine Beecher, who founded seminaries, or Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, who formed the National Women's Loyalty League, which combined the issues of abolition and suffrage. Later, the two formed the Equal Rights Association, which worked to incorporate women's suffrage into state constitutions after the Civil War. The women's suffrage movement would continue until finally achieving success in the passage of the 19th Amendment in 1920. Changes in society, renewed religious revivals, and a desire to reform oneself and change society for the better drove the reform movements of the 1800s. They supported moral reforms, such as temperance and abolition, they advocated for education, and they began a feminist movement for equal rights. These reforms would continue through the first half of the 1800s, but abolition would become the movement that exposed how deeply slavery divided the nation. Thanks for watching.